Good morning, all you hearty souls. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, sorry about the weather, uh, but we, uh, we can control only a few things, and, and weather is certainly not one of them. Um, I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the chair for, uh, the Sumitra chair for Southeast Asian Studies, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's session. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague Dan Rundy, who leads our uh, project for uh, prosperity and development, for inviting me to, uh, to have the honor to uh, open, the, open the session this morning. And, and that, I really wanted to do that because as a guy who focuses uh, on Asia, and generally, and Southeast Asia particularly, um, I have a, a very special and strong feeling in my heart for the work that uh, Lee Zak and the U.S. Trade and Development Agency do. I've worked with them for the last uh, 27 years in, in different, wearing different hats, including as the, as the president of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, uh, a business owner, and, uh, and as a strategic thinker on how the Americans engage Asia. And TDA is at the top of my list for agencies that uh, deliver return on investment. Um, not many agencies can say that for every dollar uh, that they spend, $73 in U.S. exports were generated. In fact, I can't think of any other uh, agency that can say that. Um, and over the years, uh, according to their numbers, they've generated a total of over $45 billion in U.S. exports. And this is for uh, an agency that is not large. It is a, it is a lean, mean, uh, export-promoting machine. So. Um, let me, uh, let me um, quickly introduce Lee Zak and, and Dan. Um, Lee is perfectly, um, was the perfect uh, candidate for this position. Uh, she was um, appointed by President Obama as the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency in 2009. Her background was, was perfect for it. She was a, a lawyer uh, practicing in, in Washington and Boston. Uh, in the areas of corporate, municipal, and international finance. And then she's also a pro was a professor at um, Boston University School of Law and Georgetown University Law Center. So I was happy to see that she's not from Denver, uh, so that she has no scars today, you know. <laughs> and and not, n not too low, and also not, fr not from Seattle, so she's not, you know, she's actually here, because she might, <laughs> thought she might be still partying if she was from Seattle. But, um, She's in very capable hands. You'll have a great chat with, uh, with Dan and Lee Zak this morning. And Dan, I'd like to uh, thank you again for the opportunity and hand it over to you. Thanks a lot, Ernie. It's uh, really great to have my friend Lee Zak uh, with us today and really appreciate Ernie uh, helping us out as well. I think TDA in, in many ways is the tip of the spear for American soft power, for American trade and investment. It's a big part of our future as we engage with middle income countries and you know, many developing countries are, get, are moving up the curve and are getting wealthier. And so the sort of chicken or beef traditional foreign aid of a little bit of tuberculosis medicine here or some food aid there, and I don't mean to be overly flippant, but I think you get the idea, um, I think is not gonna be the sort of things on the menu that we're gonna be offering up to countries like Burma or Vietnam in the near future, or Indonesia. To, to, or Panama or the Dominican Republic, the kind of assistance, the kind of trade and investment they want, the kind of advice they want, the kind of connectivity they want are the sorts of things that TDA serves up. And as Ernie cited, um, there's a humongous leverage from the monies that TDA uh, brings, to, uh, brings to the United States or catalyzes investment for the United States. It's in the American interest, it's also in the private sector's interest, and it's in the developing country's interest, and that's why I think Lee is welcomed so often wherever she goes and is greeted and has such constructive relationships. I will just make one further point, then we'll, we'll turn the conversation over to Lee and we'll have a discussion, but um, one, I think, Congress is voting with its feet. I think everyone knows this is a very difficult fiscal environment, uh, but the fact that uh, TDA had just, has just seen a 19% increase, and I use the word increase, so you know, if you're pay not paying attention, you've heard this, a 19% increase in its appropriations in the last 12 months, I think it speaks volumes about the leadership of TDA, but I also think it speaks volumes about how the U.S. Congress is waking up to the fact that this is an important 
uh, instrument in our arsenal of instruments that we have and engaging in an ever more complex globalized world. So, Lee, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And it's been, I guess, a couple of years since you last were here, and, and um, there have been several things that have happened since we last had a conversation, um, one of which is a, an increased, I think, emphasis on Asia. You've also started a, a new initiative on global procurement. And also, I just suspect there's just been a variety of other things that haven't hit my radar screen, but are also, I think, are, are um, that have also happened at TDA under your leadership. Tell us what's new at TDA and talk a little bit about, about some of those things I've just mentioned. Well, thanks very much, and I'm delighted to be here. And frankly, I think I should stop right here because <laughs> you and Ernie did such a fantastic job of describing the agency. But I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about what's new. And clearly, USTDA has had a long history of working and developing in middle-income countries and working with US businesses. And I think, as everyone knows here, our, our mission is to focus on linking US businesses with development opportunities in emerging markets. So as a result, we focused both abroad and in the United States. And one of the things we've done within the past two years is to develop a, glo a making global local initiative. What this does is it gives us the opportunity to link US local and state organizations focused on trade and economic development abroad with opportunities um, abroad as well. USTDA has a long history of leveraging opportunities, and we think it's really important for the US government to be focusing and working with local governments as well. We're proud to announce, and I think you saw our annual report as you came in, we have 34 making global local partners since that time, and there's our annual report. Um, and as a result, we not only work closely with them to provide opportunities, for large businesses, but this allows us also to reach out to small businesses as well through these opportunities. So that's just one of the things we've been doing. Um, the other thing I think everyone is very excited and has heard about Power Africa, and USTDA was on the trip with President Obama during the announcement of Power Africa, where we're focusing on doubling access to energy in Africa. There, USTDA is working very closely with our US government partners in Africa, but also the really important part about this is that we are leveraging the capital of others as well. And that's really a hallmark um, with respect to USTDA. With respect to Africa, it's focusing with respect to the international development banks, um, the multilateral development banks, the private sector. But the other thing we're doing is we're working with the development banks in country. And what we heard, and I think it's a little bit of what Dan mentioned, where are we going with foreign assistance today? What we heard as we were traveling throughout Africa with the president is that there's a focus on trade and investment versus aid. That people want to be given the tools to be able to develop their economies, develop their infrastructure, and to be able to partner in that process. And that's what USTDA has been doing with respect to Power Africa. And I'm very pleased to be partnering with our um, partners, OPIC and Exim Bank, um, in our office. US Today has had an office in South Africa, and they're joining us in that office for Clean Energy Development Finance Center. And the third thing that I'd love to talk a little more about in detail, but I want to give um, Dan some opportunity to ask questions. It's supposed to be a conversation, and you as well to ask questions is the fact that we developed a global procurement initiative. And I have to say that um, if you haven't seen, and I'm gonna do a plug for Dan, since oh, he did a you. plug for us, <laughs> um, the paper, a new development agenda, um, I have to say that I have to thank Dan and Scott. I mean, this is really right on point with respect to what is needed with respect to economic development. And one of the things that we've discovered in talking both with our host country partners as well as US companies, is that there's a real need to focus on procurement, but procurement for best value. How it is that one can achieve acquiring goods and services by looking at the value over time. And USTDA has had a tradition over the past couple of years in including that in some of our tools, and we can talk more about those later. But we now have developed a special initiative focusing on best value, helping host countries get what they need, 
and we think this is going to level the playing field for U.S. businesses. And as a result, they're going to discover that U.S. businesses are some of their best partners. So we have many things that we've been doing. We have a vast toolbox, but those are three of the highlights um, since last time we talked. So let's talk about the, the procurement one first, just because I, it is, uh, it's not necessarily the most sexy topic in the world. I think it's, but I think if, if I recall correctly, it's something like 15% of the GNP of, of governments, or, or sorry, flow through official procurement decisions of purchasings of goods and services. But it's traditionally been, uh, a function that's either been sort of very clerical or very much you put your 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 nephew or niece who's not all that competent or being not totally fair but there's a little bit of a bias or a and then if I think about in the US government it's not it's been underappreciated and underloved uh, though I think that's improved in the last 20 years starting with the Clinton administration frankly where there was sort of a, a push to try to improve the quality in this country of procurement buying decisions, and obviously I think it mimics the private sector. So how did this come about? How did this global procurement initiative come about? And how does TDA help with this? Because I, I agree with you, obviously we've rewritten about it. Uh, um, this is a big part of the development future. It came about um, because US TDA has a tradition of listening to its partners. One of the things we were hearing from our partners abroad, um, in particular in Africa and Asia, is that they felt like, with respect to infrastructure, they did not get a good bargain. That they did procurements in the past, they've built infrastructure, and that infrastructure is not what they anticipated. And they made those procurements based upon low cost. At the same time, we were hearing from US businesses that they're not winning these procurements because of the fact that the procurements are based solely on low cost. And the recognition, if people took into account not only the cost, but the maintenance cost in the future, how long a product is going to last, then what they would really realize is the investment that they're making at the beginning is the better investment. So a couple of years ago, listening to both of those, we included in our feasibility studies, which is one of our tools and our technical assistance, how to produce a formula with respect to low cost. So giving those tools to those procurement officers. But what we also realized is the fact that there really does need to be training of those procurement officers. And we have the support not only from US business, but we are partnering with an academic institution, GW Law School, which have a premier institute with respect to procurement. And all of the multilateral development banks have agreed to be collaborators with us. So it may not seem sexy, but it is really important. And it actually is the area that is getting tremendous attention. And as a matter of fact, USTDA is a member of the President's Export Council, which includes private sector, congressional representatives, et cetera. Um, the President's Export Council put forward a letter to President Obama asking for support of this particular initiative because that's how important it is to them. So to paraphrase uh, Vice President Biden, this is a very big deal. This is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> the, so you talk about within this, this procurement initiative, obviously you, I do think a lot of the multilateral development banks get this or, or they, they come across because they're working with governments and they understand they need. Are you working with any US government agencies or are you getting, and, and are you getting additional push or support from either chambers of commerce, or talk a little bit about it, both the US government side, either MCC or others, or, and then talk a little bit about uh, associations that, that are supportive of this in addition to the President's Export Council. Well, it's interesting. I think some of the people who have been most supportive of this actually um, include host country representatives. Um, we met with the ASEAN ambassadors, and this is also one of the places where this came up in the real need. So clearly from that community, it's highly supported. With respect to the US business community, everywhere that we have gone and we've talked about this, we've received support from the US business community as well. So it clearly is an area where there are great opportunities for partnership. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna be conducting a training in Botswana, um, which will include the private sector as well as our academic institutions, as well as the public sector. 
and we have spoken with MCC about some aspects of what they're doing. Um, but I think this is one particular niche that USTDA was made to fill because it really focuses particularly on the area that will level the playing field for US business and create those partnerships that we're known for. See, I, I could see uh, some of the donor, bilateral donor agencies that have funded EITI, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, being interested in something like this as well. I could see that as being a, a topic to pursue with, in addition to developing countries saying this is of interest. I could see DFID or NORAD wanting to partner with you guys on that. So we'll have to talk about that look, offline. And I look forward to it. It's, so, but I think this is very extremely promising. And just the thing to take away from this conversation is, is trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of business opportunities, as well as GNP flows through the decision makers' hands, government decision makers' hands, and developing country procurement officers when they make decisions about who gets who's awarded the contract for a road or even for en some of the energy some of the energy decisions as well i think also this also comes up in terms of negotiating energy agreements as well no absolutely and i think you know this is really one of the areas where we're getting incredibly positive feedback from the people who are going through the training through the host country um, as well as us businesses it really has been sort of a tremendous initiative that's received a lot of support and partnership but tell me about when I talked to you several years ago, you had sort of a, a universe of about 18 countries that were on your radar. As opposed to telling me who's dropped off that radar, tell me who you've put on that radar. Who's, who are some perennials? But talk about the three or four or five countries that have come on your radar screen in the last couple of years, because I suspect there'll be surprises for people in this audience. Well, it's interesting, and I think that's the great thing about USTDA. As uh, Dan had mentioned, I mean, it's a very nimble agency, but it's also one that's extremely strategic. And as you indicated, what we do is we look at where we should provide our funding on a priority basis. If there are US businesses that have you know, particular projects in other places, we're more than willing to entertain those as well. But where can we get our most bang for our buck um, by partnering? And you're right, um, there are a couple things that have come on. Burma um, is one of those places that USTDA is one of the first agencies that is able to op was able to open up in Burma. Um, clearly, there are opportunities um, for U.S. businesses, and it's a perfect market for U.S. TDA because, as many of you know, what we do is the early project planning, and we provide feasibility studies, technical assistance, capacity building, and that's exactly what needs to be done right now with respect to Burma. It's an open market, and it's a great market for U.S. business to be able to partner in. So we are in the process. We just opened up in Burma. There are other places as well that you know some of the countries roll off, some roll on. Panama is, a, is another country um, that has become a priority country um, recently. And I think we see great opportunities there, not only with respect to the canal, but also what's going on with respect to the development um, as well. The Dominican Republic's on that list. And Dominican Republic is on that list as well. And why is, why is the DR on that list? Because I think there we also see a real opportunity with respect to clearly energy, with respect to telecommunications. The Caribbean is looking to do things on a regional basis, mm. and we see that as a very important market, and one that really wants to work with U.S. business as well. Well, uh, I know that President Obama has made pivot to Asia a big, a big part of his, the focus of his second term. Um, and you all, as I said earlier, are the tip of the spear of a lot of that. And certainly you talked about Burma. There's an APEC and ASEAN meetings coming up. Talk, talk about other countries in Asia that are on your radar screen. Or, I, I, there are some perennials, but, it, but talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of those. No, I'd love to. And as a matter of fact, I mean, I think you're exactly right with respect to being the tip of the spear, which means we always have to be a little bit ahead of the game. Yep. So I'm really delighted that we have the pivot to Asia because USTDA has been in Asia. So it's a little bit of being able to see some of the work that we've been working on, now being able to bring our partners in from the U.S. government um, as well as the private sector. And as a matter of fact, um, this pivot for us started a couple years ago with respect to the ASEAN. Um, there was a significant interest in the ASEAN countries, and the private sector was trying to figure out how can we do something on a regional basis. And the, what they did is they came to USTDA and said, you're able to act more quickly than other agencies. You're able to be able to bring together the right people. 
So US Today developed the US ASEAN Connectivity Cooperation Program. And that program is focusing on connection between the ASEAN countries with respect to energy, telecommunications, and transportation. So we've been in the countries. I mean, clearly, as you mentioned, you know, there are the, we, you know, we clearly have India, we clearly have um, China that we've been working in. But at the same time, we've been working very closely in Vietnam and in Indonesia and in the Philippines um, and being able to sort of have people work together um, to be able to develop um, their infrastructure in particular. So the ASEAN is something that's been very strong. Um, at the same time, with respect to energy in the region, last year alone, USTDA tripled its, its focus and tripled its investment with respect to energy in the region. Mm. And we see this as incredibly significant market. Um, clearly, Vietnam, wind, Indonesia, geothermal, Philippines, biomass. So throughout the region, um, we see significant opportunities for development. And what we see is, as you indicated, US Today has already begun to lay the groundwork for those opportunities. And now those projects are able, hopefully, to be able to move forward with our many partners, both in the private sector and the public sector. T talk about your relationship with China, because you've had a long-standing relationship with China. And you, you actually, I know you have, where, I forget which ministry, but you have a number of very constructive relations with some of the ministries there. Uh, we do, and as a matter of fact, I mean, US Today has been in China for over 12 years now. And it has, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head, um, very significant relationships in China um, that have, we've been able to develop over time. And the other thing is being able to work in cooperation. So US Today developed an aviation cooperation program in China that has become extremely successful partnering with U.S. business, both large businesses, small businesses, as well as their CAAC, or their ministry with respect to aviation. So as a result, under that umbrella, we've been extremely successful in being able to bring people together so that they can, one, get to know one another, plan projects together, and as a matter of fact, USTDA is, organizes a summit with the U.S. government and China, and we recently did that. The response from the U.S. business community to that summit is that there truly was a belief that they had the opportunity to be able to meet with government officials that they otherwise would not have been able to meet with, but also to be able to hear from them about what their plans were for the future. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, following on in the aviation cooperation program, an energy cooperation program um, was developed with a similar style, um, and also a health cooperation program in China. So I go to China about uh, two to three to four times a year, depending on the year. That's a lot of Star Alliance miles. And of course, it's, it's by American. But. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it's also developing those relationships. And I think it's really um, benefited US business. And I think the goal there is also large businesses and small businesses being able to come in under this umbrella. Talk about. Um, let me just talk about one other region of the sure. world. You're talking about Power Africa. You mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm almost certain that you're the folks that are first out of the gate, out of any of the agencies to actually operationalize Power Africa. I'm just, that's just a guess. Talk about what, what you've done. And in your answer, could you explain to the audience what is a reverse trade mission? Because I think that's something special, that what, one of the things that you guys do that's, that's important and special. Sure. No, and I think it's similar to the pivot uh, to Asia, which is, again, with respect to Power Africa, USTDA has been in the region for a long time and has worked on the planning with respect to energy activities in Africa. As I mentioned, we have an office in Johannesburg. OPIC has now joined us in that office mm. for the Clean Energy Development Finance Center. Um, we virtually include Exim Bank uh, in that office so that we can have people come in, on the continent to be able to come and do the planning with us um, and be able to meet us there as well as in the United States. So we see tremendous opportunity, um, both with respect to new generation, but I think the other thing that easily could get ignored, but is incredibly important, um, which is access to power and power distribution. And as a matter of fact, um, with, in Nigeria, that is a very big issue. Power is being generated, but it's being lost at significant rates. 
And the U.S. has the technology to be able to limit those losses through our smart grid technology. As a matter of fact, in Nigeria, they were concessioning some of the distribution companies. And in that, what they indicated was they would have to reduce losses by about 50%. When people received the concession, what they realized were that the losses themselves were about 50 to 70 percent with respect to the transmission and distribution of that energy. So USTDA brought a group of delegates, the, the new people who had received those concessions, to the United States through a reverse trade mission, bringing them to the U.S. to meet with U.S. businesses that have the technology that can help with those losses. And they didn't just go to New York or D.C., right? Oh, no. Um, they go where the technology is. So, for example? So, for example, they can go to California. They can go out to Colorado, where there's very significant um, technology being developed. They go to Houston. So they go wherever we see the technology that's going to help them. So they're very customized visits. Um, the other thing that happened, actually, with that delegation is they were also invited to Congress. Um, because there's a significant interest in Africa, and there was a panel that was being put on, and they were great representatives of what's happening with respect to Africa, what's happening with respect to Power Africa. Um, they are much better representatives than we ever could be um, on the Hill. Let's talk about the Hill relations, because I think, um, I think, as I said, you are the tip of the spear. I think the fact that your appropriations have gone up 19% in 12 months, I think, speaks volumes about the, how ably led the agency is. Could you talk a little bit about how Hill relations have changed over the last five or six years for TDA, and what, what are some of the, the turning points in that, in that? Talk a little bit about that. Well, one, I have to thank Tom Hardy, um, who's our congressional liaison, um, for his help in that regard. <laughs> I think the reality is it's a matter of people understanding what USTDA does and how it's been beneficial. Um, basically, USTDA focuses on mutual relationships and so that it's jobs here at home at the same time creating a good economic environment abroad. And I think this is the thing that's really made the difference as we've been talking about what we do on the Hill is the recognition of the fact that these are not just you know, dollars that are lost abroad, but this is an investment in the U.S. future, but it also has an immediate impact with respect to jobs in the United States. So I think that has really resonated on the Hill. Um, I also think that people recognize that foreign assistance itself is changing, that there is a focus on trade, that there can be mutual benefit, and that we have to be able to provide an environment that catalyzes the private sector, the multilaterals, and also development banks within the countries themselves. So I think that's something that's very different, where people were hearing about aid, just dollars going abroad. I think the difference on the Hill today is the fact that you have a way to be able to provide foreign assistance that also brings jobs to the United States. And I think that's what's made the difference. Talk about your relationship with the interagency. When I think about TDA, I know there's sort of a little bit of a, li a linked up relationship with Exim Bank. And I think we've talked in the past about wouldn't it be nice if, if there were sort of additional uh, connectivity with OPIC and AID or MCC. Talk a little bit about, I know you have some sort of a monthly conversation that somebody initiated, it might have been you. So talk about your relationship with Exim Bank and then talk about some of the other interagency colleagues that you have and how, how you interface with them and, and what opportunities there are for synergies? Well, I think this is a really special time in the U.S. government with respect to collaboration. I think it has, people in the U.S. government are focusing in ways that I have never seen before uh, on how they can leverage each other. And you've been in public service for 12 years? And I've been in public service for 12 years yep. in private sector 18 years before yeah. that. As a um, child prodigy. I, thank as you. A prodigy. Um, and all of that time, I've never seen anything like it. That there clearly is a way people are looking to see how they can work together, how they can leverage each other. Um, clearly, Exim Bank, we, about a third of our projects are funded by Exim Bank. Um, we also work very closely with OPIC. 
But as you mentioned, I mean, the MCC has played a very significant role in developing some of the markets. And where, for example, you know, Ghana is a very good example where the MCC is involved in some road building. Well, those roads happen to go to ports, which we're involved in helping to develop. Um, so clearly the MCC, AID. But I think the other thing is working with Treasury and the multilaterals, we've also been able as a team to be able to leverage the private sector in the multilateral development banks. And as you said, um, one of the things that the heads of the agencies do is we have breakfast together at least once a month. And um, the good news about that is we actually like each other. Um, and I think that really helps. But the other thing is that our teams know that we're going to have breakfast um, at least once a month. So all of a sudden, before those meetings, um, I start getting all of these emails about, oh, can you ask them about this? And can you ask them about that? And when we go to these breakfasts, um, we are like five buzzsaws going off at once. Everybody excited about what they have to do, what their agenda is. So it's how OPIC, we think it, it's XM, it's, it's OPIC, you? It's OPIC, it's XM, it's USTDA, it's been the State Department and the Department of Commerce okay. um, have worked together, have come together for these breakfasts. That's great. Okay, so talk about the lo global local initiative because I'm quite curious. I think there's been sort of a, I think rightly so, an increased interest in sort of the role of go state governments and city governments in diplomacy. But I think you're tailor-made as an agency to engage, as you were saying, state development agencies or trade agencies. Talk a little, and President Obama has a five million job export goal in his, his time as president. Talk about how that relationship's changed over time as well and, and talk about how you're, in, obviously you're engaging them in a number of ways, but talk about how, that, how that's happening. Well, again, I think it is tailor-made for USTDA because I think what state and local governments have come to realize over the past five years is that they're really, that the US market in some ways is saturated, that they have to look to be able to create jobs, they have to look outside of the United States. And they have to help their companies to be able to export. So this fits perfectly with USTDA's mission. So at the same time that the local governments are beginning to focus in this area, this has been USTDA's tradition. So we can work very closely together to help them do that. What it also does with the Making Global Local and working with our partners is it provides a forum where we can hear where are the pockets of expertise? What is it that people want to export? And then we can do that matchmaking that you mentioned. Again, it goes back to linking US businesses with these opportunities. And so many of our reverse trade missions are designed so that we can bring them to our Making Global Local partners and be able to meet with their businesses or hold a round table with them. So the Making Global Local um, partners are our intelligence to what's going on, where there are markets, and at the same time, we can help them, especially the smaller businesses, by bringing the opportunities to them instead of them having to go to the opportunities. Can you just, last question, then we'll open it up. Can you talk about um, the advantages of being a small independent agency? Talk about what, what that's like. I know you were recently had to testify on the Hill um, in, a, in putting on a different hat and thinking differently, but talk about the way it's currently set up today, what the advantages are. And I have to say, I mean, US Today is just a phenomenal agency, and I came from the private sector, and it really is an agency that works like the private sector. And part of that is the fact that it is able to be very nimble, very agile, to be able to listen, to not be bureaucratic in its approach, and as a result, it's a little bit like you mentioned, we do our strategic planning every year, we have the ability to look forward, but if something, the world is changing constantly. And so we can change with it. And I think that's been an extremely important aspect of the agency, especially when you're at the beginning of projects. You have to be able to move quickly, you have to be able to change course when necessary, or you have to be able to stay right on. Um, at the same time. So one of the benefits of USTDA is that it is a nimble agency that is um, filled with an incredible talented staff um, that has the ability to go where the opportunities are and to be able to bring the US public with us. Great. 
All right, let's open it up. I, I'm sure there are questions. I see uh, some folks here up front. Jeremiah, we could start uh, with this gentleman here, this gentleman, and this woman in the second row, these three. We'll start, we'll bunch them together. <clears throat> If you name, name and organization, and if we keep these uh, pithy, we can do several rounds. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Andre Sobajo, and I'm uh, the chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company, LLC, in Detroit. Um, wonderful presentation thank and you. exciting. And of course, I honed in on your remarks on ASEAN and Vietnam. But my question is this. Uh, recently, uh, uh, we've designed a magnetic levitation train that uh, and, um, and we've been approached by recently, uh, just a couple days ago, with a entrepreneur who believes that uh, he has a project opportunity for us in Cambodia. So my question is, and not mentioned in, I mean, it was a lot of detail and all, but not mentioned at all was the political situation, which I'm personally concerned with, that, you know, the, with the um, uh, unrest in the election after the re-election of Hun Sen. So my, my question to you is, from your perspective, TDA, do you have any general comments on opportunities or, or lack thereof in Cambodia? That's my question. Okay. okay. And this gentleman here. We'll do this World Bank style, so we'll collect several. My name is Asmuk Shah from Business Times. I'm familiar with the activities and role played by US TDA in promoting U.S. exports into the especially developed country, especially country like India. Now, they are doing a good job helping the objective of President Obama in not only the improving U.S. economy, but creating jobs. Likewise, there is another organization of the U.S. government in the Commerce Department called Select USA. Their job is to get foreign investments into America and how to create more jobs here country like India has always been looking for U.S. investments. Now, USA is looking for Indian investments. India has invested $20 billion in the USA and created about 100,000 jobs. And U.S. is interested more because India is a big market. So uh, my question to Director Zek is that how do U.S. TDA would support the sister organizations like US, yeah. it's like USA? Thank you. Achieving President Obama's job and creating uh, objective and creating more jobs here. Thank you. Thank you. This woman in the second row. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Segera. I'm the president of Segeros International Group. Thank you so much, Ms. Dark. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I come from Kenya and I'm based here in the US. I'm a woman owned Kanban. And uh, I want to thank President Obama for the Power Africa Initiative and the Youth Initiative, which I'm also involved in the power, looking at the rural area, how we can get power in the rural areas in Africa. Because as a woman born and raised in Africa, I don't want to see women use firewood in, in between now and 2020, now that Power Africa is there. Looking at your partnership with agencies, private and public sector, we have partners with USID, State Department, where we go to the global diaspora. What are you looking to, how are you looking to work with us as global African diaspora input like the Power Africa? It involves us as global, we understand the culture, the tradition, and the problems facing Africa with power. How do we work with you, and how do we know about the procurement, the other initiatives? You need to make that partnership with us. How do we work with you? Thank you. Okay, let's take those three. Sure, I'm going to take those three. I'm going to take them in reverse order, yep. um, if you don't mind. I'm going to start with Kenya. Thank you very much um, for the work that you're doing to support Kenya. And absolutely, the diaspora is such an important part of economic development and such important partners. Uh, and as a matter of fact, USTDA really does reach out to the diaspora. We'd love to reach out to you more, and I'm going to want to take your card um, after this as well. And part of our reverse trade missions is one of the ways we do that, is by bringing the delegates here, we announce the fact that we have business briefings so that on our website, and that's something everyone should be aware of, um, which is www.ustda.gov. We provide all the information with respect to our events 
all the delegates that are coming to the United States, where they're going to be across the country. So that's something I would love to be able to partner with you on. And I totally agree, and I think it's the goal with respect to Power Africa, that there are very significant opportunities for large-scale power in Africa, but there are also opportunities for smaller-scale um, power in Africa. And that's some of the things we have been working on, in particular with respect to renewable energy. So I think there are good opportunities, and clearly our website lists all of the events and who's coming, and the diaspora is such an extremely important part of economic development. So thank you um, for bringing that to our attention. Um, going to uh, my dear friend uh, from the Business Times, um, with respect to Select USA, um, all, one of the good things when you were talking about collaboration, um, all of the agencies actually are part of the advocacy. They're all part of trying to bring opportunities both to the US as well as abroad. Um, with respect to Select USA, it clearly is a priority of the US government. And when I'm going abroad, I can talk about it. Um, but we do have different missions. And that's one of the things that we are very careful about. And so USTDA's mission primarily is to be able to encourage economic development abroad um, in US jobs through exports, whereas Select USA is advocating for investment in the United States. So our colleagues at the Commerce Department do a terrific job, um, and occasionally I get to talk about it, um, but our, our mission is really a little different from that, and we're very good about focusing on our mission and, and staying, staying on our mission. With respect to um, Vietnam and Cambodia, um, again, thanks for the work that you're doing in Vietnam. I think it's a tremendous market, and we've been very active there. Um, as I've mentioned, and as Dan mentioned, USTDA does do you know, significant research to focus on priority markets. Um, and I do know that there are others that have been you know, focusing more heavily, the State Department, on Cambodia. But USTDA actually has not been in a position to be able to include Cambodia in our priority countries, just looking at where US businesses are looking to go and sort of where the economic environment is. It doesn't mean if there isn't a very good opportunity that a US business has that we wouldn't entertain it. Um, but our criteria would include one that it really is a developmental priority in the country, that we're comfortable in working with the, the host country itself and the sponsors of the project, that there are, it is mutual benefits, so there are US exports that are involved um, as well. So we would have to analyze the project from that point, from that point of view. Um, but although we look at the region, um, it's, not it's not a priority country for us at this, at this time. We take a couple more questions and comments. The, the, the two folks in the last row right there, and then the gentleman there, we'll take those three. Hi, uh, my name is Liam Hanlon from Management Systems International. And I was wondering if you could speak about uh, sectors in Southeast Asia that have been particularly successful with regards to generating exports um, or development benefits and sectors that haven't and that have faced challenges and kind of why you see these trends. Okay, and the okay. woman next to you. Hi, Kate Sliney, also with MSI. Um, you mentioned, Ms. Zach, a little bit about getting value for procurement and listening to sort of those on the ground in Asia. How do you still encourage um, opportunities for U.S. businesses and encourage um, those to still go with U.S. contracts? Thank you. And then the gentleman over here. Thank you both very much for a good discussion. I'm Ed Barber from GoodWorks International. Uh, I was very pleased to hear about your um, efforts to increase collaboration with XM, OPIC, uh, IDVs, and so forth. Um, I'd like to move down the pipeline to talk about operating across national boundaries abroad. We are uh, involved in a transportation project in the Congo Basin in Central Africa that could potentially affect at least three countries, but historically there's been a big problem with financing cross-border projects, uh, joint and several liability and all that. Could you talk a little bit about your approach to multinational projects? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take these in the order that they were given. Um, so we're going to start with um, Southeast Asia. 
Uh, clearly, USDA sees, as I mentioned, significant opportunity with respect to energy in Southeast Asia, um, both some of traditional energy, but also with respect to renewable energy. And as a matter of fact, as I mentioned, we've tripled our portfolio um, with respect to energy projects. Transportation is also another very important area in Southeast Asia. Clearly, aviation is an area that has uh, taken off, that there's a significant need um, in the region, and we see a lot of opportunity. Um, the last area that we've worked in um, significantly is telecommunications. And what that means is almost everything. Um, telecommunications, IT has become such a significant part, whether it's with respect to customs, whether it's with respect to vessel traffic management, et cetera. So I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, so these in particular um, are the areas of opportunity that USTDA has focused on. There also are some opportunities with respect to the environment, um, and we have worked in, in Vietnam and Philippines with respect to environmental issues, water treatment, um, for example. So clearly these are the, I, where we see the priorities. Um, where do we see the challenges? Um, we see the challenges in energy transportation and telecommunications. Um, that, I mean, the, clearly there's a significant amount of competition for U.S. businesses in these areas in Asia. I think that's why it's so important and why there is the pivot to Asia. It's because these are markets. It's a $2 trillion market that's coming in the future. And clearly, you know, China is there, Europe is there, et cetera. So it's really important to be able to level the playing field for U.S. businesses. So this is where we see all the, this is where we see opportunity, um, but this is where we see challenge. Um, which moves into the next question that was asked um, with respect to the procurement. And I think we really do believe that the best, having people focus on procurement, on best value, what the cost is over time, including maintenance costs as well, is really going to be significant in leveling the playing field for U.S. businesses in this challenging environment that clearly there are other countries that have found, located these markets. They're willing to provide their goods and services at very low cost. But when you do the comparison on just the cost versus the cost over time, it levels the playing field for U.S. businesses. It then gives them the opportunity to compete on the same level. And frankly, it also gives the host country a better buy. It gives them something for long term. It's extremely respectful um, with respect to their procurement. So I think that is going to be sort of one of the things that's going to help to be able to provide for those opportunities and also to level the playing field um, for U.S. businesses. Um, the last question um, was with respect to on a regional basis. It's one of the things that USDA has had sort of a long history of which is we have focused as a, an example, the ASEAN um, Connectivity Cooperation Program, um, work we've done in Africa with respect to transportation initiatives, that we actually do look across borders. Um, and we recognize that many, in many of these countries, their economic development partners are next door. Um, and so we have to be able to encourage and work with them to be able to provide those opportunities. Um, and one of the things that we can do is work with them on areas where we can provide, you know, mechanisms for common sources of revenue, where revenue could go to be able to secure some of that financing on a more independent basis, and that's part of the strategic planning that we can do with respect to some of the projects that we work on. It's not just the technical aspect, but we also look at how can this project be financed, and there's some creative schemes um, to be able to put forward, whether there's a trustee with respect to revenues from projects that would be independent when you're talking about cross-border. So we work very closely um, with the financiers when we try to develop those scopes of work of not only, you know, if it's technical, something can get built, but you really need to know sort of what the right financial scheme is to be able to have the implementation in the long run. Okay, we got time for one or two more questions. So uh, this uh, 
gentleman there, and this Dana Marshall, phase two. Uh, hi there, my name is Tim Lord. I'm with the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce Advocacy Center. Uh, and uh, as you probably already know, um, we uh, advocate on behalf of U.S. businesses that are up for uh, procurement contracts overseas. Um, I was wondering uh, your thoughts on uh, how we could work more together, specifically on, on getting, you know, kind of businesses on board with your initiative. Okay. Let's get a couple more. Actually, yep. and this gentleman in the raincoat, I'm going to go with him as well. Uh, actually, not a uh, not a question. Just a uh, just to reinforce something that the director said. Uh, Art Did, Simonetti, Art yeah. Simonetti with Honeywell. Um, we are a uh, we're a user uh, customer of of TDAs. Um, the director made reference to uh, um, in uh, in Asia Pacific to just the importance of getting getting U.S. companies and U.S. companies technologies in there early in a lot of these projects. So. So aviation, for example, airport modernization, clean energy generation, smart grid, energy management, things like that. Those are all the spaces we play in and things we're working directly with, with TDA. Um, you know, you, you can't say enough about how important it is to get into that process early. So whether it's through the, through the um, you know, technical assistance, the feasibility studies, the reverse trade missions, it's taking those decision makers in the countries and, and introducing them to the technologies that the U.S. companies bring to bear and which, you know, tend to be done still in the United States by U.S. companies, which plays to not only TDAs, XMs, but the President's and the U.S. government's commerce's desire to boost exports dramatically. So it's, it's a combination of, you know, of, of TDA being able to get us in the door as early as possible and under Director Zach's leadership and her team, they're really doing that better than ever, which is probably not surprising that Congress, you know, noticed that and said, look at how much bang for the buck we get with such a little budget. Let's increase the budget and increase the bang for the buck. So, um, you know, it, for us, it's that, plus it's just also to something that she said earlier, it, the, the staff has a very, a very deal, kind of a deal-driven, let's get things done mindset and maybe part and parcel of being small and nimble as she said but you know as a company trying to get deals done you know you, you really value that and uh, so just really more of a compliment than any kind of question so thank, thank you Art. and Dana uh, thank you Dan it's uh, Dana Marshall with transnational strategy group Lee it's good to see you again and I know that uh, I've got clients that have used your reverse trade mission, so congratulations for that. That's very helpful. Maybe um, it's interesting, a number of us around this room have a similar kind of a question, and let me put it a little different gloss on it, but I think it's really important. Um, in one of the Power Africa countries, we have a situation where AID is putting in money for some technical assistance work. MCC is putting money in for technical assistance. Perhaps TDA is doing some work there. When you do, and I'm glad Dan asked the question about coordination, but one of the really important areas is in coordinating the various approaches that the contractors are taking in that. That, that needs also to be, I think, sort of harmonized to provide value to the target country, but also to help sort of generate the point that U.S. Uh, suppliers can be very competitive when you look at an all-in cost. So how you actually coordinate at that level, I think, is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Good comment. Um, I'm going to start there. I'm going to go in reverse again um, with respect to coordination, um, with respect to Power Africa. I, I agree with you that it's extremely important for the assistance we're providing to be sure that it's coordinated. Um, one thing that USTDA really focuses on is to ensure that we are staying within our mandate, but at the same time we complement what it is that other agencies do. I will say with respect to Power Africa, again, having been in government for a long time, I have never seen so many opportunities where the agencies are coordinating. There are calls, meetings, coordination every single week where people, and these aren't just what are you doing, 
Um, these are going really down into the detail of what are the activities you do, you're doing, how is it that you're working together. Um, one of the significant areas of cooperation and coordination is that USTDA um, has the ability to do not only project planning, but also to fill the gaps for financing. If we see opportunities where there's a piece that's missing, whether it's an environmental study, whether it's a lawyer for a PPA, um, et cetera, we have the ability to provide that assistance. Um, we're doing that in connection with some of our sister agencies, OPIC, Exim Bank, that are subsequently doing the financing. So if they see a project that they're looking to finance, and we were talking about that before, and there's a piece missing, they'll notify us um, so that we can help provide that technical assistance. So I totally agree with you, coordination is key. If you are aware of things that you, know, you think we should know about, I'd be happy to sit down and talk about it if it's not working the way it is uh, that it should be. Um, but I can say I've been incredibly impressed with the administration um, because they have been the ones who have been steering many of, or basically coordinating a lot of these meetings um, to indicate we want to know what you're doing, but we don't want, we don't want to know about fluff. Um, we want to know about the details. What are you doing? How are you working together? Um, it's clearly a mandate we've received. And if, if we're off track, I'd love to know about it to see how we can, how we can work through it. Um, Art, thank you very much um, for your comments. Um, it really, it's a, it's a great example of collaboration where we've learned a lot from Honeywell about sort of what the needs are for U.S. businesses and what we can do to be able to help in the host countries for economic development. It's been a terrific partnership. Thank you. And um, with respect to the Advocacy Center, um, we work with them constantly. Um, as a matter of fact, um, one of the tools that USTDA provides are training grants so that if there is a procurement um, and that uh, their host countries are providing other kinds of sweeteners um, for their um, companies, oftentimes the Advocacy Center gets involved in advocating on behalf of those U.S. companies and USTDA has been able to provide training grants. So to go along with goods and services, we can provide a grant that provides for the training with respect to those goods and services. And those are always coordinated um, with the Advocacy Center. So it's been a very good relationship throughout the years and even more so of late. Well, Lee, this has been great. Thank you for making Thank the you. time. Please join me in uh, thanking Director Lee Zak. Thank you.